I think what we'll do now is move on to um, Paul Hammond, uh, who's going to give the next talk, as Anthony was clearly keenly waiting that. So what we're going to do is move on. So Paul uh, studied uh, applied mathematics at Cambridge and first met Anthony as his PhD examiner, which having uh, heard uh, Herbert's uh, comments there must have been quite scary, I would imagine. Uh, subsequent to that, he worked as a scientist and research manager in the Schlumberger Research Centre here in Cambridge. And he had broad uh, interests in multi-phase fluid mechanics and flow in porous media. So Paul has known Anthony in many ways as a, as a colleague, a mentor, and I think as we're all here, a friend uh, for nearly 40 years. That sounds really scary, doesn't it? Uh, Paul is now retired and uh, he's a trustee and a cellist in the City of Cambridge Symphony um, Orchestra, but he retains a, a very active interest in theoretical fluid mechanics, as we're about to hear as he presents a very interesting talk on, very topical, will we ever wash our hands of the lubrication approximation? So Paul, uh, we're going to move over to you now. Thank you very much, Dave. I hope you can hear me all right. So, um, well, first of all, I'd like to say you're right, Anthony was my external PhD examiner and I've more or less, uh, more or less recovered from the experience now. Um, thank you to the organisers for inviting me to speak today. It's uh, indeed uh, an honour and a privilege to um, contribute in this celebration of Anthony's birthday and it's chance for me to thank him publicly for all the help and support he's given me over the years. So, Anthony, thank you very much and I hope many more years. Right. So, when Simon asked me if I would uh, contribute today, um, I'd not long previous to that uh, read a JFM Focus on fluid, uh, Fluids article about uh, COVID-19 topics. Um, it's well worth a look if you haven't seen it and it contained this remarkable sentence, which I'll read for you. Amazingly, despite the 170 year history of hand washing in medical hygiene, we were unable to locate a single publication, published article on the flow physics of hand washing. So this struck my imagination and it certainly seemed like a clear challenge to fluid mechanicians. And um, since I'd, uh, I was keen to find something useful to do during lockdown. Uh, perhaps there was scope here to do something um, potentially contributing in a useful area. So um, what I'm going to do in the rest of this presentation is tell you what I got up to and I hope you'll, you'll find, if not um, anything of great uh, mathematical merit there, at least food for thought and perhaps an inspiration to make your own uh, forays into this um, apparently unworked field. So what's this got to do with Anthony? Well, it seems reasonable to think that a lot of the key action in hand washing occurs in the thin film of uh, soapy water between the two hands. And as soon as you have thin films, the temptation to make lubrication approximations becomes almost impossible to resist. And um, I think Anthony will sympathise with this um, temptation since, uh, on my count at least, around a quarter of his publications have applied a lubrication or long and thin or small slope, slope approximation to um, usually novel situations where uh, the light of mathematics had not previously been uh, shed. So I hope he'll find here an affectionate and uh, respectful echo of the techniques he's used to good effect. And I hope also he'll appreciate the, um, the attempt to apply them to uh, dirty real world problems. So dedicated to you, Anthony. So um, why bother? Well, obviously um, hand hygiene is a topic of global interest right now. Um, and we all know how to wash our hands, although maybe you know we need to be told to do it for uh, 20 minutes, rather, 20 seconds, I'm sorry, rather than just a quick, uh, quick uh, splash around. Um, but as soon as you start thinking about this, at least me um, doing this for my, my spare room and uh, uh, somewhat cut off from the literature, there seem to be questions about the mechanisms, how it, how it actually worked 
which seems strange, but going back to that original citation, maybe not that surprising. So for example, how and where are pathogens deactivated? Is it all to do with getting things off the surface and into the bulk, or is there sufficient, a sufficiently rapid, rapid transport of surfactants and, and uh, other um, chemical species to the surface where the pathogens are sitting to deactivate them then? If it's all about getting stuff into the bulk, how are virus particles removed? And most of what I'm going to talk about today is, is the process of removal, in fact. As soon as you've, uh, of course, as soon as you started talking about mechanisms, you need to think about what are the controlling parameters, what are the influential parameters. And there's always a temptation to wonder about whether there's scope for making the process more effective. Um, as I said, we've been washing our hands for a long time and probably no piece of mathematics is going to have a big effect on effectiveness but it might give us some insights into what's going on and perhaps it'll tell us something about the character and vulnerabilities of the target pathogen rather than the the process of hand washing itself so with that as a motivation let's have a look at how we might uh, apply some uh, mathematics to this. so the first thing you're going to need is a representation of the the situation. I'm particularly interested in what happens when in the film of fluid between your hands when you rub them together with the soap. So we're going to need a representation of rough surfaces and relative motion and uh, the simplest thing to do is to have a couple of uh, sinusoids moving backwards and forwards relative to one another. Here's a little little picture. Obviously you can make this a lot more complicated if you wish but this is a simple place to start. So the gap between the surfaces is going to be uh, 2a they're going to move relative to one another with the speed u, one going to the right, the other going to the left. We're going to have a wavelength here, uh, 2 pi upon k, that's a characteristic axial length scale. And the distance of closest approach between the two surfaces when the peaks of the roughness are opposite one another, I'm going to call that eta a. So the surfaces are going to move. Here's a snapshot at different times, the, uh, the bottom moving to the, uh, to the left, the top surface moving to the right. So, um, say fluid film in between. So, as soon as you've got a job, as soon as you've, you, you're in a position like this, you need to ask a few questions about transport mechanisms. And so, one important thing to think about is the role of uh, diffusion. So, Peclet number here, I was quite surprised how large this was. Um, if you're rubbing your hands relative to one another, the velocity is probably of the order of about a tenth of a meter per second, maybe a bit more if you're very energetic. The gap between the surfaces, well the widest point is probably getting near to a centimetre, but the points of closest approach, pretty close maybe um, tenth of a millimetre or less. And then in terms of the diffusivities, well for a, um, a short chain surfactant um, is about ten to the minus nine square metres per second, and uh, which uh, is experimentally determined. And if you estimate for a 50 nanometer virus particle, which is our, um, our foe, the coronavirus, uh, that comes in from the, um, the Stokes-Einstein relationships about four times 10 to the minus 11. Anyway, if you plug those into the formula for the Peclet number, it's of order 10 to the four. So surprisingly large and you know, diffusive, diffusion doesn't seem to be doing a lot here. It's, this is a convection dominated situation, unless I, made a stupid error in the arithmetic. The other thing um, to know about is the, um, or for now, is the Reynolds number and this is modest but um, not uh, not much less than one unfortunately. Now in lubrication geometries you get a factor of the slope bringing this down but uh, although today I'm going to totally ignore the effects of inertia actually it's not it's not completely negligible so um, there may be some real physics going on here which isn't going to be captured by what I'm going to talk about but anyway for simplicity uh, today is going to be a, a low Reynolds number talk and we're going to worry about diffusion uh, excuse, excuse me advection dominated situations okay so let's go about analyzing the fluid flow in the gap between our two hands and we're going to use that fluid flow to try to um, track how particles get detached from surfaces. So 
place to start off, of course, is the, the governing equations here, the, uh, the Stokes equations. And as Anthony was very fond of reminding me, some boundary conditions. So we've got no slip boundary conditions on the two surfaces, basically representing them sliding relative to one another. For convenience, we're going to work in the frame of reference where everything's uh, symmetrical. And um, if I'd got a finite element package installed on my MacBook Pro, I'd probably uh, not to go this way, but uh, I haven't. So we're going to use um, lubrication approximations to turn this into something that's algebraically uh, tractable. So lubrication approximation, small slope, the wavelength I mentioned earlier, k, uh, 1 over k, I'm sorry, is uh, very small compared to the, um, uh, very large compared to the, the gap. And so we've got a pair of equations when you've dropped all small terms. First is the um, the first here is the uh, incompressibility relation and uh, that tells us that uh, transverse velocities are smaller by an order of magnitude than axial velocities and also gives us a relation between the two. Uh, and um, then the momentum equation degenerates into the statement that the pressure is independent of the cross stream coordinate and the um, second derivative of the uh, of the trend of the uh, long duct velocity is uh, proportional to the pressure gradient, with the viscosity being uh, coefficient proportionality. Uh, something that's going to figure in the analysis is the, is the volume flux across any station, and that's simply the integral between the upper and lower surfaces of the um, uh, a long duct velocity component. It's time dependent, of course, space dependent. And the reason for bringing this up now is there's a, uh, a simple but very important little relationship that you can get by um, differentiating the, the integral expression there um, and then integrating it again. If you differentiate it with respect to x, you find when you take account of the boundary conditions that the um, rate of change of flux along the duct is proportional to the slopes of the upper and lower surfaces. And if you integrate that and you uh, realize that you are working in a frame of reference, which by symmetry means that the uh, flux across the, um, uh, the, the midpoint of the um, domain in the x direction, x equals naught if you like, the flux there is zero by symmetry, you can find the constant of integration, and then you get a closed expression for the flux. So nothing um, non-standard there, but it's a handy thing because when you get to writing down the solving the equations for the um, uh, velocity components, we're going to have an unknown pressure gradient, and that expression will uh, allow us to um, get get to to determine it. So the a long duct velocity component, little u, uh, there are two contributions. This one's a linear shear flow driven by the fact that we've got two surfaces in in shearing motion relative to the other, and the other contribution you have is a, a parabolic. Um, pressure gradient driven term. Uh, the way I've got this set up, the, uh, the shear flow satisfies the boundary conditions and once you've satisfied them, the pressure gradient bit satisfies homogeneous boundary conditions. So that's, that's just a uh, direct integration of the, um, the axial momentum equation. You can integrate that to get your hands on the, the flow rate Q, just integrate and we get the, the classic cubic dependence on gap width of lubrication theory. And then if you remember the expression I had on the previous slide, you can equate the um, flux. Uh, I gave you an expression there for the flux Q. You can use that to equate that to this expression that tells you the pressure gradient. And then the, the pressure gradient is proportional to the velocity. It's pr inversely proportional to the cube of the gap width. And it contains contribution from the average uh, from the, from the, of the displacement of the surfaces from the uh, the midpoint. So that, that's all straightforward algebra and you can compute everything you like and uh, you get time dependent fluxes and uh, time dependent pressure gradients etc. Nothing, nothing terribly uh, uh, complicated there although it took me a while to get the algebra right because uh, I'm a bit out of practice I'm afraid. Armed with that lot you can go back to the um, uh, the incompressibility relations and you can work out the cross stream component of uh, velocity. Again, standard stuff probably found in every textbook and uh, hopefully any first year uh, um, researcher in fluid mechanics knows all that uh, 
backwards. So what does the velocity field look like? So um, it's not so difficult to um, form the stream function and to uh, compute um, stream function, uh, to contour the stream function. And uh, uh, following Simon's um, suggestion, I uh, learned how to use the Julia program language, which you can download for free onto your, uh, onto your computer. So here are some stream, here's the contours of the stream functions at four different times in the laboratory frame of reference. So the bold black lines are the surfaces of our hands moving relative to one another. Here t equals naught, I've just started them off in a particular configuration. A moment or two later, the lower surface has moved slightly to that, that way to the left, the upper surface moved to the other side. A bit later in time, still a bit later in time, the next move would take us back to the original picture, but shifted by uh, half a period. Um, so what you can see is um, we've got um, here where the surface is well separated, we've got um, the streamlines being pushed, fluid being pushed out of way by the uh, advancing edge here and being sucked in around the back of the uh, retreating edge, the mirror image situation on the other side where it's moving in the opposite direction things get squeezed as the gap gets narrowed, symmetrical situation here, and then the picture forming the other way around as uh, particles move through. So the important thing to note is we've got some stagnation points, rear stagnation points and front stagnation points, and those are going to um, figure later as being important. Here's uh, the same um, information, but with the stream function plotted in a frame of reference moving with the lower boundary, and I'm going to place a little particle for tracking on the lower boundary later. So this is really the flow pattern, which is interesting. And what is important to look at here is uh, really two things to spot. One is what's going on up here. This is basically saying that the fluid in the, in the depths of the roughness is really being carried along without a whole lot happening with the moving surface. But if you look a little bit more closely at what's happening down here, we've, we've again, we've got, we've, got a, we've got a stagnation point, the point where the streamline separates. But, you know, because this is a time dependent flow, because the boundaries are moving all the time, the point at which this happens moves, it's there at one instant and it's, you know, there at the next, it's totally disappeared, at least at this resolution at that time. So, a little particle sitting on the bottom here is going to see a very time dependent flow. Sometimes it's going to see stagnation points. Sometimes these will be pulling fluid away from the surface. Sometimes they'll be pushing fluid down onto the surface. And, um, you know, figuring out the, the effect of this time dependent flow on, on the particle is, is, is not totally intuitive of this. You actually do have to uh, scratch your head, at least uh, I had to. Anyway, lubrication theory has given us um, a, a, a velocity profile, and once we're armed with that, we can start tracking particles. And so I'm going to treat um, um, the virus particle as a, a little sphere of uh, radius d, um, subject to fluid drag and to an attraction with the wall. So attraction with the wall through a potential and fluid drag through a, a linear Stokesian uh, resistance. And this is a force-free particle, so the, the drag force is going to balance the wall of interaction in some sense. If you do the simplest and perhaps laziest thing of assuming that the drag is isotropic, uh, there are no specific modifications to Stokes drag due to the presence of the wall, which is a, a big and probably wrong thing to do, you can rearrange all this and you discover that the time rate of change of the position of the particle, x dot, is equal to a contribution from the fluid velocity, vector u here, so it's carried around by the fluid velocity, but it's dragged, it's, it's forced to move relative to that by the force coming from the uh, interactions with the wall through the gradient of the wall interaction potential. And um, the wall interaction potential, we might as well, um, since, um, well, since I don't know too much about what this is, I'm going to have a simple form where we've got a short range repulsive potential and long range uh, and a, a modest range attraction. Here's the force. Uh, force is zero at the pot potential minimum, a distance of order little l from the wall. Uh, there's a, an increase in force until we reach an attractive peak. 
a distant little L from the wall and then this force falls off actually quite rapidly as we go away and there's a strong short range repulsion which stops the particle getting crushed into the wall and so on. Um, is this realistic for uh, biological particles? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. Maybe somebody who knows better can give some input on this. I, I don't think it'll change the qualitative conclusions, but for sure, quantitatively important. Two parameters, lambda, dimensionless parameters. Lambda, which is the uh, thickness, the thickness of the, the range of the attraction, I'm sorry, compared to the width of the gap, and capital B, which is dimensionless measure of the strength of attractive forces compared to the strength of fluid drag forces. So you can see here we've got a beta, which is the overall amplitude of the force divided by L, uh, you know, potential gradient, so beta upon L is the force, and then six pi d mu u, that's Stokes, Stokes drag force. So we've got beta upon L balanced against Stokes drag, and that's going to be a critical parameter in, in setting everything that goes on in what follows. So once you've done that, it's just a question of coding up the differential equations in uh, a few lines of, um, of Julia in this case to uh, do some particle tracking. So here's some example particle tracks. So what are you looking at? So we're working in a freight, we're, we're looking at the, the big bold black line here, the sine wave, that's the lower wall of our pair of hands. So it's my, it's a, a little roughness, perhaps, you know, skin texture size roughness on, on that hand. Um, I'm going to let the particle go at the red dot and I'm going to track it over time and in the frame of reference moving with the lower boundary its path is given by the blue line here which moves across. It's actually dragged along by the shear flow from the upper boundary moving rightwards in this frame of reference. Starts off here. The, dot, dot, the dashed lines represent the position of the, the potential minimum, the maximum force and the edge of the potential. So once the particles moved beyond the dashed lines, essentially it's no longer experienced the interaction with the, with the lower wall. Got a blow up here, which is perhaps a little bit difficult to see, so let's blow the whole thing up a lot bigger. So what happens? You let the thing go and over a number of cycles of the uh, roughnesses running over one another. We see the particles dragged along here and then as it's past the, the crest it experiences a bit of extra pull which drags it out and uh, eventually it gets further dragged out and zigzags out towards the, the bolt fluid. So at the peak of the roughness um, if you run enough of these simulations and look at the results, you can convince yourself that things get tugged out by a, a peak of flow um, happening when the, the points of, uh, of um, when the narrowest point of the gap is, is developed as the, as the peaks go across one another. Perhaps not surprising. If you release the particle somewhere else, and here I've got a case where it's let go at the base of the roughness, you can see the blue line goes across this way and something happens over here. So again, blowing that up. Basically what's happening is we're down in the, in the sheltered part of the, the depth of the roughness element. There's some kind of time average standing eddy pattern here, although instantaneously it certainly isn't uh, anything like that. And then eventually the particle gets convected to a point where, again, in some time average sense, we've got a rear stagnation point and then gradually We've got some sort of outward going converging streamlines and those drag it out slowly. This is very different to what happened at the peak though. Here we move along slowly just because velocities near the wall are slow, are low relative to the wall because of the no slip boundary condition. Uh, and when we get to here there's a lot of many cycles of the roughness you know periodically translating over itself as this comes out things are going on very slowly here at the top basically it's a one-shot process you get dragged to the top there's one strong event of peak to peak interaction and then the thing gets pulled off so the way particles are removed from the wall in this model at least very different depending on where they start off and where they experience key features in the flow so if we let the simulations run for a longer time um, well, the one that was released at the upstream here, it gets pulled off, it still tracks the wall down and then gradually it gets involved in 
the what I've called the, the, the rear stagnation point bit of flow gets pulled across into the free region here and because there's a the, these are low Reynolds number and reversible it reattaches on the other side eventually and then and re, re, de, re detaches uh, but here we've managed to transport our particle from close to the wall into the bulk and then, so if surfactant attack in the bulk is important you know this th this is where it's going to happen and this is how it's, it's set up to happen for the one that was released at the bottom that tracks its way all the way around again to the stagnation point region and then again is pulled out and translate gets itself into the bulk and again because of reversibility ultimately finds its way back and then here's quite a, a, a cute example which may or may not be physically real slightly different parameters we get detached we come back and then because of the way the timings work out there's a, a, a an unusual flow event which pulls things off towards the other side of the channels this is quite rare generally speaking things stay on the side of the channel where they start but it is possible to find examples where it's not the case so if you do a lot of stimulations you can start mapping out the critical attraction strength above which particles can no longer be detached and this little table shows how as we vary the uh, the wavelength of the roughness starting off from um, very steep rough or steep roughnesses in lubrication theory here down to very shallow roughnesses in still within lubrication theory for detachment at the top the uh, critical value of the dimensionless parameter b um, gets smaller as the roughness gets less extreme and that sort of means that uh, uh, because the fluid forces are getting less extreme so uh, less attraction is capable of holding a particle stuck on the wall that's for the top for the detachment at the rear the same trend appears but the overall size is different if you compare these for roughness um, wavelength 0.1 10 to the minus 5 critical B for detachment at the top, 10 to the minus 7 for detachment at the rear. So um, fluid forces are stronger at the top, or put it another way, um, stronger attractions can be broken by fluid effects at the top. Um, it's possible to um, make an order of magnitude um, story about why this is so. And to, to do that, first of all, you have to... Um, realize that it's the normal component of velocity not the u or v component but the actually the wall normal component that's important if you then uh, remember something that you probably did in part three where you look at the you look at the um, dependence of um, velocity profiles near the no slip boundary you convince you can convince yourself that the wall normal component grows quadratically with distance if you go back to the original governing differential equations basically we're trying to balance potent the attractive force against fluid drag and if we now use these ideas about the normal velocity to estimate the fluid drag we can um, convince ourselves that the for detachment at the top the uh, wall normal velocity is going to scale with the, the shear velocity um, a factor of the slope because that's what appears in because um, we're, we're looking at normal components rather than axial components and then we get a, 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 a lambda squared for the the uh, distance of the particle from the wall that comes from the uh, the dependence of the un if you put all that together and realize that it's the narrow dimension rather than the wide dimension that's important you can convince yourself that the uh, beta the, the b at the top should scale with ka lambda squared over eta with some numerical factor in there two seems to work quite well for detachment at the back it's much more uh, it's, a, it's a it's a more difficult argument because it's the time average i told you it happened over multiple periods so we have to time average everything uh, but we seem to there get a small parameter epsilon which is to do with the time average velocities we get the same kau lambda squared but we don't get the eta because it's happening in the wide position anyway if you put those together um, and work out the numbers you don't get a, a wholly ridiculous comparison between these little orders of magnitude and the results of the simulations so in conclusion what's happened um, so the calculation shows perhaps not surprisingly that you can remove particles from surfaces provided um, 
the balance between attractive forces and fluid drag is favorable. Uh, there's this, the scaling argument I just gave you, gives you a, um, a quantitative relation between the strength of the attraction and various geometrical and uh, hydrodynamic parameters. And so, for example, by staring at this for a while, um, a few very obvious things become apparent. For example, the faster you move your hands relative to one another, the larger you is, and therefore the stronger the attraction can be at the point at which it's broken by the fluid flow. I mean, rubbing your hands together is better because it'll pull things off that are more tightly stuck. Not perhaps that surprising, but the dependence on some of the other parameters like the, uh, the roughless inverse wavelength, perhaps there's some insight to be gained there. Um, most uh, interestingly, perhaps, is there's a, there's a threshold effect here. If you don't, if, if the B parameter isn't big enough, things are not detached. I didn't show you any simulations for that, but, it, but that's what comes out very clearly. So there's a threshold effect in you. And maybe uh, experimentally, if we're trying to distinguish deactivation on the surface from deactivation in the bolt, the presence of this threshold effect could help. You know, if it's deactivation in the bulk, I guess you wouldn't expect a threshold effect. You might expect a Peclet number scaling, but maybe not a threshold effect. Um, when, um, within this model at least, um, when the attractions are strong, particles are swept towards the rear stagnation point and accumulate there. So, um, you know, rubbing your hands together, maybe it's a good thing, but equally you might be actually grouping um, deleterious material together which will subsequently get removed. Maybe, maybe that's not always a good thing. That's what comes out of this uh, little analysis. And um, the fact that the Peclet number is large, meaning diffusive mixing is weak, that, that's, this, I mean, that's quite surprising because it means getting surfactant in or surfactant off, say, a bar of soap that you're rubbing against your hand. Maybe it's not so easy to get that really down into the, uh, into the nooks and crannies where it's needed. Um, the gap width is a key parameter in all this. A and the other uh, points of the distance of close approach, E to times A, also pretty important because this, this influences the uh, critical values of the forces and the parameters. And of course that's set by how hard the, uh, the surface is being pushed together. And uh, I've treated it as an input, but really it needs to be um, uh, a bit of elastodynamic lubrication theory is needed to predict that. And um, I know Anthony's worked on some fracking problems and those often involve a, 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 an interaction between lubrication theory and elasticity. So there might be something else that um, uh, he, he knows plenty about here. And, uh, certainly is an interesting topic to do. So um, is lubrication still theory still useful? Well, I think it is. I think um, you know it's possible using only tools downloaded for free from the internet and a bit of um, bit of uh, knowledge of fluid mechanics to uh, come up with a, a few interesting conclusions here. So I think uh, what Anthony has, uh, Technic Anthony has used for many years, is still valid, and I hope. Um, uh, I was going to say, when I come to my 90th birthday, people will still be talking about lubrication theory. Well, I don't know. Anthony, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and a real privilege working with you. And I hope you've enjoyed uh, this little story today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. There, As you say, it's amazing what you can do with some free software and one million times the compute power that <laughs> Anthony could uh, uh, dream of at the beginning of his career. <laughs> so again, we move on to uh, Q&A. So uh, if you've got a question, if you could uh, raise your hand in the Zoom method, which is to, ah, and we have some here. So I have uh, one here from uh, Tim Pedley. Uh, right. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thanks to everybody for organizing this uh, and to Anthony for being its purpose. But um, the question to a uh, comment and question to Paul, the comment is that it's always surprising to me at any rate uh, that lubrication theory works so well in such a wide range of cases, especially when you didn't think it was going to. Uh, the question is, can you, uh, in your model, uh, estimate the forgiven value of other parameters. How many, how many cycles of the uh, 
uh, bumps rubbing against each other do you need to get a substantial displacement from the boundary? And uh, <clears throat> uh, does that, uh, is that lie behind the uh, request that we receive or instruction we receive from uh, outside that 20 seconds is required to wash your hands? Well, I don't know where the 20 seconds comes from. I suspect that's purely experience and, you know, heuristic. Um, the answer to your question is yes, though you can absolutely. So the removal of the peak process, um, you've got to get the particle to the peak, which takes a number of cycles. Once <coughs> it's there, it comes off in the next available cycle. So it turns into a question of how long does it take to transport there. The removal at the, on the, from the rear stagnation point, the removal at the back, again, you've got to transport across. And then because the, uh, the time average um, stagnation point flow is actually rather weak, it takes a lot of cycles to get the thing out. So I did, um, I, I did work out the order of magnitude timing and um, off the top of my head, remembering what I worked out, it was about 10 seconds, which is um, a, a lot of cycles to get the thing off from the, um, from the back. So I think, um, uh, the, I, think, I think there is something relevant coming. I think, I think you're putting your finger on something important here. And, um, uh, um, yeah, the lubrication theory is telling us it's quite hard to get particles away from boundaries. And that, that's, you know, that's just the no slip boundary condition acting. Um, but yeah, the longer, the longer you, you work at it, the more chance you've got of getting stuff off the boundary. Of course, you know, if, if it's all to do with deactivation on the boundary, then maybe it's a bit quicker. So yeah, I think, I think you, you put your finger on something it's there. It's good right? to hear that, yeah, the uh, longer is better on this then. So, yeah, Paul, well, we've, got, we've got one, uh, one more uh, question uh, from uh, Sandeep Saha. So, uh, Sandeep, if you would like to ask your question. Uh, hi, Paul. How are you doing? Hi. Yeah, good, thanks. Uh, two questions. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is the, sto the, the soap might... Uh, start to foam or have a froth. Do you think that would affect the motion of the virus? And the other is uh, the palm itself would deform. You know, when yeah. the palm. And yeah, do you so, think that would affect the normal velocity? And uh, uh, Yeah, no, absolutely. The, the, so taking those in the, the opposite order, the, the def, um, yeah, absolutely, you know, the physiological surface is uh, soft and I'm sure the lubrication pressures are big enough to deform them. And that's going to change things. It's going to change the profile of the roughness and highly important. Um, I'm sure it'll change the gap spacing at the points of closest approach. And it's going to, it's going to basically blunt the, 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 the points of closest approach. And because the hydrodynamics there is critical for at least one mechanism, one, one mode of release from the surface, um, doing hydro, um, elasto hydrodynamic treatment of this is I think necessary actually because it's all coupled this is actually a very high, highly non-linear pro problem because the, the, the channel geometry depends on the forces the flow depends on the geometry etc etc so again I think that's you're putting your finger on a good point there the point about this yeah you know, the soap bubbles and all that sort of thing um, I mean this is a whole um, uh, what what's clear? I mean, I recommend that you read some of these articles on on um, uh, the COVID um, uh, focus on fluids and so on, because uh, there's all kinds of processes here. It's not just about rubbing your hands together. It's also about rinsing stuff off. It's also about uh, you know creating lots of surface and perhaps you know virus particles um, are surface active in some sense. Of course, they're interacting with surfactants, so you can get that. I, I mean, the fluid mechanics of hand washing is not just the little little corner of the topic that I've talked about today. Definitely not. You know, there's there's probably several PhDs worth of work here, uh, uh, looking at all different ones. I I, I, I didn't think about the uh, the foaming aspects of all this, but um, you know, the, the, it's worth thinking about because I'm sure there's something interesting going on. So Paul, thank you. That's absolutely great. So we, we thank you, Paul, for giving us uh, such a firm grasp on a slippery subject. 